There's been lots of stories about Kevin Lane, gangster, killer, hitman, etc., etc. You can read stuff, including your own book, which we'll talk about later. How would you describe yourself, Kevin? I wouldn't describe myself as, first of all, a hitman. I'm certainly not a gangster. You ended up getting a life sentence at some point in your life. How old was you at the time? 27. What was that about? Tell me what that is about. There was uh, a murder. And you didn't see daylight for 20 years? 20 years. Almost to the day, because I got out in 2015, January. Handed me my tariff. And it said 18 years. And I went, what a touch! <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's many people who will punch the air because they've just got 18 years for something they didn't do. Imagine thinking you've just got 30. Do you see that? I said, that's a knife at your throat. I said, and the two fellas behind me here, I says, they're going to stab you to bits. I said, if you put up a fuss, we're going to take all your canteen, your PlayStation, and tomorrow you're going to phone your family, you're going to get them to send some money into an account. I said, otherwise oh, you're going to get done again. You got that? Yeah. Sat back. I went, that's what it's like in prison. Do you really want to go? Mm. The attitude just, mm. oh, no, I don't. Always good to start. Thanks for coming in, Kevin. Welcome, Raph. Good to see you. And you. I like to start by asking you who you are because there's been lots of stories about Kevin Lane. Gangster, killer, hitman, etc., etc. You can read stuff, including your own book, which we'll talk about later. How would you describe yourself, Kevin? So first of all, when you're doing podcasts and such, you're working with the title that you've been labelled by the media and and uh, I wouldn't describe myself as, first of all, a hitman. I'd describe myself as a hard worker since a child. I have morals. I believe in certain morals and I behave in a certain way accordingly. Um, I tried to find the good in a person rather than the bad and was given the benefit of the doubt. But I'm certainly not a gangster. Being a gangster can come in many forms. So you can have a fight, you've ducked and died, you've bought a few lorry loads and nicked gear, but you've I have, and I've worked extremely hard all my life. But if a lorry load of something came up, washing powder, for instance, I'd have it. And uh, it's like in the old days with the docks, people would get gear and it was okay, but now it's a charge for that. I accept that. But I'm definitely not, as I'm labelled, um, a bit harsh, some of them comments, but you have to take that, don't you? And these are the labels that the media give you, but it's not the person that, that you are. I go out my door every day and I'll in interact with people for no reason just for having a chat about the rain or something or a, 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 a comment off the cuff. But it's always good. And I bet if people said, how many people have interacted with Kevin that have never met him today through the day? You watch the internet go mental. So I met that man, I didn't know who he was, and we had a little bit of a laugh and off he went again. That can't be such a bit of a, a bad gangster, could it? And just a man that goes out and enjoys nice company. Rather than trouble. Which can come at your door at any time. Tell me a little bit about your your early life. Because we know you spent a considerable period of your life in prison, which we'll get on to. But before prison, who was Kevin? So I I grew up in Harefield. It's a village, large village. It was a very busy village for pubs. So there's a lot of pub calls there. But I grew up in a family. My mum and dad separated. Um... And I worked, worked very hard as a kid, various jobs. I was, you know, paper round at 12, but before that, gardening rounds and washing cards. And, and I kept them gardens going. Uh, so getting the income in. And then I didn't know, and I didn't know any notorious villains. I didn't know the names of anything. I didn't know who the craze were. I didn't know nothing. So I met a girl. Uh, I mean, I've been home flat at 15. I shared it with a fellow of mine, actually a friend of mine who was 18. Um, working for myself, expelled from school, got an apprentice carpentry, went off and did that for a number of years. Um, and then when I finished it, I decided I didn't want to do it no more. And I went and started buying and selling cars because I thought it was more lucrative. I went from that to, uh, to a number of other projects, finding my way in my own life, bought my first flat at 18. So going from school and as a young kid working, going forward, it's always been work, work, work driven. Mm -hmm. Providing for myself and doing well. And taking care of, at the time, Kim as a mother of my children. I had two children by the time I was uh, 20. Um, 
I bought my own house before I saw my first one when I was 18. And that was my pattern. But the mother of my children, she was with uh, a well-known family in the neighbouring town. I'd never heard of them because they didn't mean nothing to me. I just wasn't interested in, I'd never read books as a kid. Um, I was more interested in girls than gangsters and books, okay? So I met this girl whose family were well-known. From there, I started working the doors. As young as I looked, um, I was asked to work the doors, and there must have been a reason for that. And I think, one, because I could approach people and talk to people, and two, I could listen, I could have to take care of myself if I had to. I was boxing, you know, I was boxing as a kid on and off. Uh, from that, I started working the doors, I've then met people, and you branch off then into the criminal underworld, because you have a lot of opportunities off you on the doors. Back then in the day when doormen were doormen, they need, had doormen there because they needed them. Not now where it's pretty much uh, uh, normal to have doormen on any premises mm. now. Um, and then, of course, that took me down a path uh, that ended up in me in prison. Choice? Was it your own choice? Or was it, like you say, took you down a path because it was the only route open to you and making money? Or was it because the relationship you was in, the family that you were now tied into... So was it a choice or was it something that you felt slightly forced on you because of the lifestyle of being a doorman and what that entailed? No. At 18, being asked to work licensed premises, that for one, there weren't old enough to be in. Some of them were 21. And they was asking me to go and work on licensed premises in Ealing and a club called Broadway Boulevard when you have to be a member to get in there and you still get turned away. Um, places in Ealing and London and such. Uh, so it was more excitement. Oh, I'm on the door. Mm. Uh, loved it, it was excitable for me, driving flash cars. I mean, I didn't, uh, it's a nice cars anyway. So um, for me at the time, I think it was maturity or not being mature that took me in that path because you've always got a choice, haven't you? Mm. My choice was, wow, off I went. Um, if I hadn't gone into that, I would have, con I always worked. I would have continued working and wouldn't have been distracted by working nightclubs till three in the morning and going through doing raves and such all night. So then maybe my life would have been different. And I wouldn't have met so many criminals through the door. It was the first time you got in trouble with the police? I was a kid. Yeah, a child. Um, but real trouble with the police. That was just a warning from the police and a plan on the building site and stuff. I had a punch up with a fella. And he's older than me. I broke his nose. I was only 16, 15. So I was 15, and by the time I got nicked, he went to court at 16. And I had a fight with him, and I got done for GBH, and then I went to um, detention centre for that. What did you learn from that? Mm, not a lot. But it would work. Because they could do woodwork at a detention centre. <laughs> But from that, I took what I made at the, in the attention centre, because uh, I just stopped boxing at the time. I had inflammation on the knee, so I hadn't boxed since I was 14. Um, and I missed the, the PTI, which is more like a brutal circuit that they're going to batter you in. It was run by uh, police. So by doing the carpentry, I then went for an interview for uh, an apprenticeship with Joyner, uh, fashionist Joyner. So what I made at the attention centre, I produced it in the interview. I got the job. Because I think I was the only, per the only kid there that had taken examples of work that I'd already made. Right, okay. So that taught me that, and that was about it, really, because I didn't c go on and meet any friends from there. But the idea of sending you to a detention centre at a young age would be to teach you something so that you go, when you get out, you lead a law-abiding life. Isn't that what it was supposed to be about? Yeah, but it isn't. How many people do you know have been in Borstal detention centres detention centres and have continued on that path. Mm. So does that not show it's failing? Mm. You try and tell the, the Joconian powers to be that what they're doing is wrong in the prisons. No one listens. They want to do it their way, punish you, beat you with a stick. Don't follow other countries that are doing exceptionally well with their criminal justice system and reoffending. No, we adopt America's and Canada's stance and fail. 
and do their courses that have been reported to have failed 10 years before we started doing them in the UK. Why is that? Why are they continuing to do that and no one takes charge of it? There's no essential thinking skills in the criminal justice system prisons, renamed because essential thinking skills failed. So they've re-adopted re a new name and off they've gone again. It's disgusting, but I've digressed a bit there. You ended up getting a life sentence at some point in your life. How old was you at the time? 27. What was that about? Tell me what that was about. There was uh, a murder in 1994. A gentleman was murdered called Bob McGill, local face in the area. Tough cookie. Uh, two suspects were arrested for that. Uh, number of tip-offs naming them as one was shown off a gun in a pub bragging that they'd done the murder. So the police obviously had their focus on these two individuals. I can't name them anymore because uh, one of them is complained that I'm endangering his life by mentioning him. But the fact is it's, it's, it's in the public domain. It's, it's not like I'm endangering his life. It's not like I'm bad-mouthing a person. Whatever is in my book is from the criminal justice system. I argue with them. Um, so I can't, I can't mention them, but there was a, a corrupt police officer who was their handler. That's been accepted, I've got it in writing. He came into the case. They obviously were uh, agreed a deal. And I've never had the deal in writing, but I know they engaged with confidential chats with the police in relation to brokering a deal and they needed to speak to their solicitor further. Are you saying that at the point of the murder, these individuals who were arrested brokered a deal with a corrupt cop? Absolutely. This is before you're arrested? Before my arrest. And that is in the book. You've had uh, Mark Daly, Panorama, Louise Shorty, Duncan Campbell, a number of papers reported on the same confidential chats, off-the-record chats. Well, I have the public immunity interest documentation on that that was disclosed at a uh, court tour of the Old Bailey, disclosed to the legal team. And then we got them and we made an application to them. So it was in, op uh, in open court. Um, but we weren't notified of it. And we wanted to know why we weren't notified of this ex parte hearing. So um, they were disclosed to his legal team. Uh, we received them and it was damning. Absolutely damning. Before you give me the details of that, there is this hit on this individual that you just mentioned by two people. You were arrested for that hit. Yes. And convicted. Convicted at a 10 to 2 uh, jury on a second trial. How, how did you end up being convicted? If two others were in the frame, how did you get into the frame? Well, there's the question, isn't there? So I'm nicked with you. You've got a great understanding of this. So we're nicked together on a joint enterprise. If you're there, I'm there. I'm not nicked with you conspiracy to supply me a car. I'm nicked with you as being at the scene to commit the murder. Okay, you've supplied information on that murder to the police, yet you're charged with murder. Why wasn't that information reintroduced as evidence against you and put before the jury? So, well, how come you know so much about the murder? But no, it wasn't. It was under, put under PII, broken the deal with the corrupt police officer, and the deal with he'd be out of it halfway. Sure enough, he was out of it halfway. And I never found out about the confidential chats until 1999. This is, what, five years after you the, were... The murder. So you were arrested for the murder in 1994? 94. In uh, fact, I was arrested in January 1995. The 10th of January, I was released after two days and then re-arrested on the 26th and then charged with murder. And you didn't see daylight? For 20 years. 20 years. Almost to the day, because I got out in 2015, January. And this is the important point, isn't it? Because although you're convicted and you're destined to spend the rest of your life in prison, you've always maintained your innocence. Exactly. What more are you going to do? Some people turn around and say, well, go home and get on with your life. Well, I'm not going to go home and get on with my life, because... When they bleeding done that to me, I said, you are not going to get away with this. I ain't going to let you get away with it. You've fitted me up. You've let the other two go. No good pal. Excuse my French. And I don't like swearing, but there's absolutely nothing good about them two. And that's not because I'm passionate about it, because it's fact. 
they're doing deals and sending people to prison so they can walk free. And now they're flying through the, the, the prison system at a great pace of knots. When other people are languishing, you've done nothing for years. Why would they do that, Kevin? Why would individuals put you into a frame of a murder that they knew you didn't commit? And I know we're dealing with unscrupulous individuals, etc. But that's what people would want to know. Why would they set you up if you're in that world with them anyway? I wasn't in that world with them. It was an e I was an easy fool. So I came home from Tenerife. I, was I bought a car. That car was stolen the very first day I bought it. I was then loaned another car. The car that I was loaned, I gave back because it was an absolute old bang. And the car that I nicked was a new car. I give that car back. The car that was used in the murder was duplicated in terms of number plate, but there was a lot of differences, but the colour was near enough the same, but there was a lot of differences, engine size, wheels and colour and that. And so the car that I was loaned was put into me before the murder, should I say, and then they duplicated that car, carried out the murder. So it came to me, stopped with me. And then you've got to say, why did they do that to me? But why do a lot of people get fitted up? Why do people get all sorts of tragedies happen to them in their life? I certainly upset someone. Was it the police or the individuals that fitted you up? They nicked me a few years earlier. They nicked me for ringing cars. He said, I'll have you one day, Lane. The policeman? Yeah. And you can mention his name? Yeah, no problem whatsoever. I mention him all the time. He's... He's changed his name now anyway. And this is a corrupt cop who has been convicted in a court of law over his corruption. Over his corruption. Mark Daly of Panorama, when he did the Panorama program, they were refused the right to name the police officer because he's changed his life. 96, you're convicted, right, of murder? Yeah. And you're sentenced to life imprisonment? Yeah. And from that day, you maintained your innocence? I went, I went straight into Belmarsh, back to the Special Secure Unit. They sent me to Whitemore Special Secure Unit. It just reopened after the escape in 94, which you'll remember, won't you? Mm. Um, and I ate a geezer first day I arrived there. It was meant to be no good. He's an informer. He's dead now, but uh, he was an informer anyway, it's fact. So I, I hit him. And then I said, well, no one can say I've told him anything. Because I was so paranoid about what had happened to me. I thought, I'm not having this. You've put me in a gaff with a geezer who's informed on people, and he's doing, I'm not having it. So I had an altercation with him. Well, not an altercation, really. It was just a couple of punches. And he was, that set that record straight. But I was put straight in the block. And from there, I picked up a, a pen on the road to David Jessel mm. of Twilight Hour. Mm. Mm. And that was the start of the, the campaign. I thought, I'm not having it. I'm in the block. It's just what I'm going to be faced with for the, the next however long my life's going to be. Because they never told me what sentence I got, Raph, until I was in uh, three years later. I was going down to reception. And a right dog screw, I say that respectively, because there's a lot of good in the job. But a right horrible git wanted to give me my tariff. So at court, the police was asking for 30 years. Asked the judge for the sentence for 30 years before the trial was even, even uh, started. So this screw's called Kevin. He's come here. There's an SO, actually. And, yeah, what is it? Yes, I've got something for you. I thought, yeah, you get it. What you got for me, then? He's gone, handed me my tariff, and it said 18 years. And I went, what a touch! <laughs> <laughs> I was expecting 30. <laughs> he must have thought... Really? But no. Well, he didn't know what I was thinking, did he? So I got that. I got the 18 years. I don't think there's many people who will punch the air because they've just got 18 years for something they didn't do. Imagine thinking you've just got 30 and I've just got 12 years with lesser. Imagine that because I was always thinking, what age am I going to be out if they give me 30? Blimey. And then I might not get on 30 because they might get three or four years over your tariff and whatever else. Very daunting. So... To have light at the end of the tunnel gives you light. You, you, if you lose that, which a lot of prisoners do, they turn mm. to drugs, they let themselves go, they turn to chocolate, whatever, you know, whatever mm. their addiction is in there, or they just, you know, they just wither away. And for that, for me, it was a, a big boost. How did you do that time? 
you know, people do, as you just said, some people wither away, they turn to drugs, they, you know, become fitness fanatics, whatever it is. How did you do the time that you spent in prison? Because you weren't in open prisons, you were in maximum security prisons, right? You were an A man, double A man, and I've even a triple A man. I mean, people probably think that don't even exist. They do. And I, no, it does. <sighs> How did you do that time? So, very difficult at the beginning of my sentence, very problematic uh, with staff. Because you were angry, you were retaliating. Yeah, exactly. Retaliating more so to threats. So I was angry at the system for what they'd done to me. And the last thing I wanted was a screw threatening to beat me up or tell me they're going to hit me. Or we're going to do this to you, Lane, when we get you down here. And, okay, well, let's sort it out now then. So that was quite problematic for me at the beginning. Because one, you said, I'm not having this, I'm not having this. And I've got you threatening me. It, young man, quite volatile, I accept that. Um, but this emotional anger of like, how have I ended up here in the belly of the beast? How could they do this to me? Because... I said to my mum, I said, listen, I'm going to prison here, mum. I said, I'm telling you now. She said, how can I say because of the evidence of what I know they're not telling the truth. And because I knew they weren't telling the truth, I knew I was doomed. But what chance do you have when you know that the people have brought you to trial are lying? So, and there was, I got guilty. But I got the 10 to 2, I accept that. So there were some there that weren't sure about it. But I had a police officer on the jury who was the, the foreman. You're knackered. They're picking your jury for you and then putting a police officer in there to advise them. I don't think that's correct. Yeah. 18 years. Yeah. Served 20. I suppose people can't get their head around how you spend 20 years in prison and come out and be the man that you are today. Well, I drank a lot. I used to get drunk in there. And I Oops. say that, Oops, but I've I, I, I done some mooch a little while ago. I did my own brew, but 130 bottles. And uh, even on the outside. On the outside, right? <laughs> People were buying it off me, trying to buy it off me. I, I give a lot away, but I make an exceptional drink. I don't make an L2 bob they make in there. So I take time in it. I love it. I keep it warm like a baby. And they grow up, don't they, to be big and strong. I've said that many times, but um, yeah. So I used to make the ooch and train. No TV, because I don't want to tell you. I want to tell you when I go home. I'd get one out sometimes on a Saturday evening to watch, or Monday evening to watch Panorama. Uh, and then I went to Franklin, and they had a pipeline video on a Saturday night, 8 till 10. So, do you know what? I'm going to watch a film once a week for a couple of hours, and then telly goes back in the office. Well, it only lasted a week or two, because the video, the D C uh, DVDs they were putting in, jumped or stopped the phone wasting more time in. Why would you do that, though? I mean, having a TV in your cell is a little bit of a privilege. It's an escape from the walls, I suppose. It's a distraction from the reality of being banged up. Why, why, why would you punish yourself in, in that way? Well, I wasn't punishing myself because I did not want to sit there and go click, click, click and vegetate. So what I did, I worked on my case. And all I did was work on my case seven days a week. You ask any screw that's been on the lands me, said, uh, all the years they've been in, he works the hardest. He don't stop on his case. Because a TV will you go click, oh, I watch this, I watch that, it's two hours, three hours. So I used to think the more letters I can get out, I'm a step closer to getting to that door or getting to overturn this conviction. So I'd occasionally have uh, a night off when I was drunk. But I'd wake up in the morning, 6.30, bang out of that door, in the gym, doing a circuit. I was Jim Orley for 12 years, the latter part of my sentence, uh, in the high security system as well, which is good. Why'd they keep you in the high security system? We, you have reports from the police that are obviously somewhat biased, and that made a number of allegations. You have no way of contending apart from your Category A reviews. Well, that's not deaf ears, isn't it? I mean, most of the time. I was released from prison because I forced their hand. If I hadn't forced their hand, I'd still be in prison now. What do you mean you forced their hand? So with the campaigning, that brings um, a number of interests from a number of quarters, whether it be serving police officers, et cetera, et cetera. 
Uh, Sally Chidsoy, for instance, interviewed two police officers, one serving, one retired. Both of them said, fit me up, and one of them said he'd seen a statement that wrote, wrote out and signed in his name. And then this is the other fella, but I can name him, um, naming me for the murder. So I've lost my thought there. What was you saying there before that? I was trying to get a, a sense of why you were a Category A prisoner all that time that you were in prison or for the length of time that you were in prison. Why? Why did they, I mean, the, the nature of the murder itself, you know, described as a hit, suggests that they saw you as a hit man. And that's why you were locked up in the first place. But to keep you as a Category A prisoner for a long period of time. So there's the point we're making, Sarah, is so... In those confidential chats that my co-defendant had, he named me for a number of murders that, that are still unsolved, and he named me for them. So not just the one that you were serving 18 years of a life yeah, sentence? Yeah, And I was told by my solicitor at the time, if I'd have got not guilty, there's three police forces waiting to dock arrest me. For other murders? Other murders, yeah. And that's absolutely disgusting when you think about it, that an informer, can go forward, give information about a murder, one that he's charged with as well, and it gets put forward as cast creek evidence. Never before has it ever been mentioned about me doing that. Never. And then all of a sudden, some dude who's running around telling people he's killed more people than, uh, who did he, 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 he used, Freddy Krueger is what he was going around in prison saying. Okay, yeah, I mean, he's bragging about it. So, again, it's not me just that I've got bad taste in my mouth over this. It's because people come and tell me, and I think, he's doing what? He used to write to Reggie and Ronnie. I want to go and visit them. So I want to be like the craze. Yeah, mad. Um, when these people are supplying information, uh, it gets held against you until a police officer, can only be a police officer, sent some information to my solicitor, anon anonymously, of course, and in there was a number of documents that hadn't been disclosed. We went straight to the Court of Appeal. And as a result of that, I was downgraded within two weeks and chucked off the cut out of the system. Bang. Yeah. How long was you on the book then? So, two felt 16 years. 16 years as an A-man. Yeah. That's hard. That's hard. I mean, ju just, just for people that don't understand. I mean, I was an A-man, so I know exactly what it was like. Mm. But for those who, you know, the little book, the A on it, and, you know, I don't know if it was the same in the time you were there. Still but got the book. Still got the little book, yeah. little blue book with big yeah. A on it. Still keep it. Lights on in the cell for the duration. So for people that don't understand what it's like to be an A man, and this is the highest category prisoner in a prison, what is it like? What does it entail? Well, you've got cat A, single A, double A, uh, treble A, and each one has its different security uh specifications so double a you move cell every two weeks they move your cell they pack your kit put you in a cell um a lot more security checks your visits for instance you have a member of staff sitting on your visits like here touch them um camera above your right here you could stand up and touch the camera and that's in your, so if you've got children sitting here remember a, a, a stranger sitting there it, the conversation's Strain, not strain, mm. but not the same. Triple mm. A, you're checked every 20 minutes, light on every 20 minutes, through the day, at night, permanently closed visits. I couldn't even touch my children. So the hard parts for me when I went away was not having decent visits with your children. And then I didn't see them for nine years. Permanently closed visits is very difficult. So you have restrictions like that. Again, the, the classification you're held at because the intelligence that has been supplied on you is by from the police who's put you there in the first place corruptly. They're not going to say you're an angel. They've got to keep enforcing that you're a danger. And this is an important point, isn't it? Because it's not the prison that categorise you. It's coming from outside. So it's the police saying this is a dangerous individual who needs, needs to be restricted by ACAT, AA. It's not the prison service saying Kevin is a dangerous man and needs to be on a category. It's the initially comes from the police who say that you're a dangerous man and need to be categorised. And do you think that was because it would restrict your ability <laughs> to fight your wrongful conviction? Isn't that amazing? You've touched on exactly the same point. And I always said that. 
So Michael Howard introduced permanently closed visits for triple category A. And he also authorised bugging of legal visits and visits for, we accept to being bugged for high risk, single A and maybe a few key people that are under suspicion, but triple A permanently bugged. I was made exceptional risk as soon as they passed that law and moved upstairs with the IOA who escaped out of Whitemore at the time and made triple category A. And at that time, I was the only man in the country, whilst on remand, not found guilty, put in that grade. And I thought, how can they do this to me? Why aren't they just leaving me at high risk? No, they wanted me triple A so they could listen to what I'm saying to my barrister. And then, of course, put a screen between us so the barrister's holding up pieces of paperwork and we're discussing them while well, I've got a prison officer not much further than an arm away from me in the legal office through a door. I could touch the door and he was outside of that door which was a porter cabin. You could hear people talking outside the door. So they had full uh, access to my defence before I even went to court. And I believe that's why I was made exceptional risk at that time. What did prison do for you? I mean, psychologically, physically. I mean, I, anybody who knows anything about prison kind of understands, but you, you described to me, Ken, what did it do to you psychologically? Because you weren't the same man who went in prison as you were over the years that you were in prison. It shaped who you are today. How did it shape you? A better man, as hard as it is to say that, I've got far more better understanding and appreciation of a lot more stuff, more understanding of people. I'm far more tolerant. I don't react as quick. It's given me a lot of skills. As mad as that may sound, but that's because I used my time. You know, I read The Guardian and um, not all the time, but, you know, when I could because I was busy, literally. I had to get many letters out and stuff. So um, my vocabulary improved massively. I've read a lot of books now because I didn't have the TV. Studied qualifications um I'm, f I'm far better with people i've always been a kind person you know i'll always stop for the underdog or open a door for a lady or do something you know some people might say well it's a bit soft but i don't mind being soft like i'll, I'll play with cats i've got four cats now <laughs> yeah um prison a lot of regrets so much time to think Growing up, my, my father passed away. My father was an alcoholic and I hadn't seen him for many years. So this is a typical regret. And obviously my dad had, had an alcohol uh, addiction. So I'd bought a new house. Um, Kim had just had the baby, the second baby. And I got a phone call. I'd gone down the road to get something. My dad was around for dinner. I'd seen him again after a number of years, put him into a room, bought him new clothes, you know, just getting him back on his feet. And Kim found me up and said, you better come home. It's a problem with your dad. So I came home and my dad was drunk downstairs. He'd found some drink in the cupboard. And and it broke his heart. I could see it broke his heart that he, he was drunk, but I didn't think that now, then at the time. So I said, come on, I'm, you're not getting drunk around here with my family. Uh, and I'd never see him again. And he died. So if a few more years of maturity on me, I'd have understood the addiction not that he should not have done that in my house in front of my missus and my kids because he couldn't help himself. So I probably would have continued and fought my dad's addiction with him and stood shoulder to shoulder with him. That's something you learn, don't you, as you get older and wiser and you understand those issues. And this is before you went to prison. Yeah. But during the time in prison, becoming the man that you were becoming, you would have reacted differently had you known. But no one can be blamed for that, right? Because as you get older, you become wiser and more aware of other people's issues, things that you might be selfish about, and you probably did the right thing at the time, you're protecting your family, right? From something that was disruptive in your life, you're trying to do the right thing. Should have worked with him, should have got him around and made sure there's no drink in the house. In hindsight, it's easy <laughs> yeah, said, isn't it? Yeah, I made a bad, poor decision. And there's other, you know, things like that in my life where I wish I just hadn't made the wrong decision for a lot of reasons. I, I was, I had no father. My dad died, like I say, and I didn't see my father when I was young enough. Well, I had a dad. Uh, my mum remarried, really of course, and he was an excellent man, but I didn't take him at, like my real dad because I was a rebelling him, like a lot of kids do, unfortunately. He was a good man. But if I'd had my father there, my hero, 
I'd have gone by example, and my dad would have put me right when I was going wrong because he was no softy. He wasn't like a big tough cookie and that, but he was a man's man, and he would make sure I'd walk the straight line. Most definitely. Mm. But you can't kill our with about some maybes, can you? What, what, what has that done for you as a father then? Because you spent 20 years in prison, separated from your kids. How have you been able to bridge that gap? Because that, as you say, must have been really difficult. You know, closed visits, them coming to visit you. I saw a video of your son at one interview <laughs> where... He talks about he's on his way to bring you his granddaughter. So he's as a grandfather, no, you yeah. you become a grandfather while he was in prison. How have you been able to bridge that gap? <laughs> Sounds mad that I was very lucky that uh, from when my children were born till I went to prison, I was very close to them. I spent a very active part in their life. Oh, I played Father Christmas at their school, and they're looking at me, thinking, "I know this voice," and I'm going, "Ho, ho, ho!" And all. <laughs> <laughs> they're looking at me, right? So <laughs> I'd go to the football training and take the youngest one as well as my eldest one. It'd be pouring me rain, I'd be the only dad there. So I was very close to my two eldest. Luckily, when I came back home, that bond was still there. Even after 20 years? Yeah. But they're young, grown men now in the years that you've been in prison. And even though you might have spent time with them over a visiting table, it's a big gap. I didn't see them for nine years because of the exceptional risk and just... When I talk about being able to touch someone from where I'm, sit where I'm sitting, so behind me, there'll be a, an opening for a door. The same length again as my arm will be another door, and that would be the toilet. So my children would get up, bear in mind there's a screen further away than you are, and if I had to lean in, I could probably, I would be able to touch the screen, but the chair was situated back here, and there'd be a camera on me there. And if I, they said, and like that, and didn't keep my eyes on the camera, okay, so I was doing something with my eyes, they would terminate the visit. All right? So my boys would go into the toilet where there'd be staff sitting outside, staff sitting on the visit, on the same table. My kids would come out, they'd have to get all their hair shapes, right, hands run through it, arms up, shoes off. Five-year-olds. Seven. And, and of course, they'd be dragged out crying. So I didn't see one of them for nine, and the other one still suffers through it now, prison and even down to going places where there'll be a lot of people there. He doesn't like talking about my prison life, one of them, at all. Just tries to shut it out. So that's a very painful time for him, as it was for my other summer, Tommy. What uh, about the, 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 the men you met in prison, the kinds of people that you interacted with in prison? Well, you make some characters. A lot of good people in prison, and a lot of bad. You find your own level, don't you, pretty quick? Find who you want to mix with. Mm. Or I'd mix with anyone if they were all right, if they were decent. I'd give anyone the time of day. And then if I didn't like you, it was no good. I'd just tell you to clear off or uh, my earlier days, a little bit different, but I just definitely wouldn't have it if he was no good or was the right smell about you. But then saying that, there's people in your predicament who was on the landings I would talk to because they were fighting their justice and I'm not having it. And they've been around, and you know what I mean, Raph, didn't you? Mm. And I would talk to anybody if I, if I felt they was all right. But, um, How did you manage the, the prison staff? Because over the years, it changed, didn't it? I mean... Last names, all of a sudden first names, badges, and you were in prison during the sort of transition where they're always trying to change the dynamics between prisoners and prison staff. How did you manage that? Because at one end, they're probably kicking the f out of you in a, in, in a single cell somewhere, and at the other end, there's some trying to be nice, which is a real difficult balance, isn't it, when you are desperately fighting your wrongful conviction and see everybody as the enemy, at least I did. How did you manage those dynamics? I have to say it's down to my personality because staff would call me Kevin, whether it was a governor, prison director, to say, hello, Kevin, how are you? I thought that was a sign of respect. Um, and also because how I conducted myself, I'd say, good morning, uh, 
uh, Mr. Clark or, or Brody, whatever I called him by their first name a lot of the time. Um, I, I, um, I didn't see them as enemies. I just see the ones that were making life difficult as absolute pricks. And then the ones that would help you out, uh, a bit of kindness in their heart, sort an application out for you. I was grateful for them. A lot of people used to talk to me in prison like this in terms of staff uh, because one, your record turns around and says, my record was quite severe when I first went away. And it said, don't tell Lane black is white or you'll have a problem. If Lane says he's going to do something, he will do it. Uh, and it's very difficult for me to say this sort of stuff because I don't mean this as a lot. My shoulder's going back and my chest is out. I didn't even know this until some years later when I was told it was read out to me. Um, he will react instantly. Uh, and they said, he la Lane drinks, manage him. Mm. <laughs> I thought, well, that's a touch. <laughs> so because I've been drinking in the units and that, and they couldn't work out how I was doing it and stuff, and I was getting pissed. Dancing like John Travolta and falling asleep <laughs> naked on the bleeding floor, opening me up, they have to put me in the bed because I was naked. And I was to think, I'd come out and i think, well, it's only you lot have been cleared to work in this unit, so I'm only seeing you lot. How many birds was on last night <laughs> when you put me to bed <laughs> naked? <laughs> I used to have a laugh about it. You know, I didn't care. So the staff, I found they treat you as you are. And if you're all right and you're not going around just hitting people for the sake of it, you're only hitting arseholes or bullies. And like I said, when I first went away, it was that type of thing. And the staff would say, well, he's no good. He did threaten Kevin. You know, it's not like he's gone out and singled that member of staff out. Uh, and I said, I found my level in that area. I said, well, he, he don't bother no one. He's very respectful. He's good for the wing. He likes to laugh. He has a drink, but he's no bother. You won't have no one around who has a drink. And never, there's never one punch up in all my parties I had in prison. Never one. And you couldn't come to my party unless you dressed up, Raph. I said, no, put something decent on. We're You're making down, right? it sound like you have open access to parties. You're still banged up in sort of single cells, aren't you? You're still, I mean, probably for the most part. I had 12 or 13 people in my cell sometimes. But it's only during association period, right? It's not like you're unlocked all day, every no. minute of the day. It was like short, sharp moments. Long Larton was good because they opened up at 12, cancel work, and you go through till seven. <laughs> so we was on it. Right, one up straight for no open. You got we banged up at twelve. You opened up at two. And we didn't go to work till seven. So you bang up over, bang up with a bottle or whatever you got, and then lads would come and we'd have a pie and dancing like you was at a bleeding disco. And that is the I feel one of the best releases for me. That I've been crying with laughter from people doing mad dances. And if I hadn't had that form of release. How would I have come out the other end of just sitting in a cell all day long, having a bit of a laugh with your mates and that, but I, honestly, dancing and laughing and crying. Didn't do that all the time, but every time I had a drink, I definitely had a bloody good laugh. Um, and I feel that got me through, as well as the training. So my aggression, my anger was coming out in the gym all the time, beasting myself, really. Just, and, and I've never really, I've always trained hard, but... There's a lot, lot more in prison. It's testosterone field. So the king of the jungle, mm. I can do more than you can do stuff. It's crap, really. But the, the lads push themselves to protect themselves. Some do it to be a bully. Some do it for survival. Some do it because they just want to be fit. Uh, but that and the drink and the love and support that I received right across the board from family and friends and journalists and such. I mean, I've got that many journalists. I wrote to you, Raph, mm. bleeding years ago. I wrote to everyone. Um, that got me through. The, 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 there is something missing though even in all the things that you described that help get you through and that is the intimacy of a relationship you know these parties didn't have girls in there women in there it, 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 there is a big gap as well isn't there because you know you might have been sort of doing what you were doing to help get you through but there is there's no females there taking part in this party there's no family or anything you're still alone you might have a few prisoners in that cell with you or a few people getting tanked up with you there is huge gaps in that. How, how do you cope with that? So prisoners cuddle a lot, not in the wrong form. They hug, 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 because they're missing that feeling, that having the arm, someone's cuddling them. It was only a little while ago someone was telling me about this, that they, it's been discussed now what someone gets from that hug. Take that away from a person. Take the, the passion away from family ties. 
you lose your family ties. Most people split up when they're doing a lump of bird. Now, if we'd have had conjugal visits, family ties a bit together, women wouldn't go and have three or four children by different men. The man would get through his time a lot better. He's got something to look forward to, to see his kids in a hut, in a part of the prison, if he's deemed suitable enough and uh, good enough. That would have done a lot more. So I accept what you're saying in terms of I spent 20 years. I never had a, I never shared with anyone. They always put me in a single raff. Even when I went through the system, mm. they put me straight into a single uh, and I used to get embarrassed over it and go and buy the last tobacco. So I'm so sorry I didn't, you know, if you ejected out your cell. So I, I accept that I, I had a massive part of that missing from me. Uh, when I came home from prison, I was starved, I feel, of, of affection um, from a woman. Oh, I had a girlfriend for a number of years in prison. I, again, when I came home, I'd been with a lady for nearly five years. Uh, so I was getting all that type of love. But you're not in a bed with them. You're not cuddling them. You're cuddling a pillow in your bleeding single bed that you've got to move over on. The, you can't roll over in a prison bed. You turn over on your side, don't you? People don't understand that. Mm. So there's all those sort of factors that take into how it has an effect on you when you come home. Um, it, I'm pretty lucky uh, in that department where I've never been single for too long. But I'd imagine some men have problems engaging with a woman because do they lose confidence? I mean, there are probably many factors to why they don't, but it's something that needs to be addressed because it's affecting the criminal justice system so badly where it's making men harden and withdraw into themselves and turn into a drug or turn to something. Um, we definitely need reform massively. And, and for the record, that's just there are no conjugal visits in UK prisons. When did it end for you, Kevin? You know, you're in prison 20 years. How did you get out? So this paperwork was sent to my solicitor from an anonymous source that come from the police. Uh, we went straight to the Court of Appeal and there was an emergency court hearing. The difference being, well, it was a massive investigation that took quite some time. But the Court of Appeal said, we're not interested in what you have to say to CCLC. We just wanted to report on the facts, not your opinion. And they went off and did their investigation. It's all cloak and dagger. You got retired police officers from Hertfordshire, where I was convicted, supplying information. It was Hertfordshire conducting the investigation, really. Um, it, it's very difficult to talk about that because uh, if that paperwork hadn't come out, I'd still be in prison now. But during that investigation, Lord Chief Justice Hughes stepped down from a bench and I'd sent him my legal representation, which you know you're not allowed to write to the judge, but I didn't give him one because I used to write straight to his clerk and I'd send him a video of BBC news bulletins and if you're not aware of this information, Your Honour, then I want you to, to preside over this case and know you are fully informed. So he stepped down and I was... Disappointed because I fancied him being honest as best they could, you know. Lord Chief Justice Rafferty stepped in. Mm. Lord Chief Justice Rafferty was sitting at the prosecutor. So Kalisha was a prosecutor in my case, and he died of a massive tumor. He had a massive tumor on his head. He was bending the rules and doing all sorts of things he shouldn't have done and saying things in front of the jury which he shouldn't have done, which got me convicted. Absolutely. Um, he died uh, some weeks after I was convicted. Lord Chief Jeff Rafferty was sitting by his bed and they'd agreed to set up uh, a charity called the Callisher Trust. The Callisher Trust funds barristers during their training. Where do you think some of the barristers were working during their training, funded by the Callisher Trust? The Criminal Cases Review Commission. She stepped in to sit on my appeal two weeks before it. She'd never been sitting there. She's got too much of a uh, an interest with Mr. Kalisher sitting in his bed when he dies. She's never going to overturn my conviction, is she? When her trust that she set up is funding barristers in the Criminal Cases Review Commission, and it was one of her colleagues, uh, loved ones as a friend, should I say, it was his biggest c conviction. Mm. And I feel that that uh, was appalling, and my appeal failed. Um, and my barrister swore in court over it. 
literally. So it's appalling. So I'm going to go back up again, based on the Panorama program. I'm just trying to find a barrister. I've got a barrister, Dominic D'Souza, but I'm having difficulty with my legal team in a minute. My barrister, Joel Bonathan, has now become a judge. So I've got to get a new barrister. And I'm in discussions with Dominic, but my legal, my solicitor, just can't get hold of him, can't get a reply from him. So your convictions have not yet been overturned? No. You were released on licence, on parole? Yeah. And for anyone who doesn't understand what a licence is, it means you can be recalled to prison at any point for any reason that they deem is in breach of your licence. You know, you could fart and you could end up going to prison if they say you're not allowed to fart, for example. Bad it's behavior. a trivial uh, behaviour. And you've been recalled to prison since your release. When was you released? What year? Last year. And you've already been recalled back to prison once? Twice. Twice. But I got out in 2.15. I got recalled in 2.20. Uh, I was recalled for a common assault, non-custodial offence. And if it hadn't been me, my name, the person who uh, had the common assault would have been charged themselves for why I was held at the premises and the damage they caused to my car before I was able to find my property and leave, keys, wallet and such. But because it was me, life licence, I threw my girlfriend after she'd done a number of things, all on camera, so I'm lucky I've got it on, on camera so I can prove what I'm saying. And on the f five times I put my ex-girlfriend at the time back indoors, drunk as you could ever imagine, on the fifth time I've thrown her back indoors again. Don't mean phone her, but I put my arm around her, carried her. On the fifth time, she's walking around the road in Ascot with no bleeding underwear on, no bra, and a shirt, a little shirt. Drunk. I found my car keys by this time, and I reversed the car back out, and she's kicked and damaged the car to bits. It caused £2,000 worth of damage to it. Just drunk. I was sober. I just wanted to go home because she started drinking. I thought, well, I'm going. Ripped the number plate off the car, all dents down the side of it, with keys and all sorts. I'm sitting in the car thinking, my God. So on the fifth time, I've got out of the car. And I ain't justifying it. I'm not blaming someone else for my actions. Yes, I threw her. I went, oh, God, I've had enough of you now. And that got me 14 and a half months. And I got released and I got recalled two months later. And as a result of that, a number of probation officers have been reprimanded severely for falsely reporting. Now, if I was on bail for six months, running a business, employing people, running a successful business, why did I need to be recalled as soon as I got found guilty for common assault? Because mm. I didn't get on my probation officer. And that's the one that's one of us been severely reprimanded for falsely reporting, putting restrictions on me that were setting me up to fail, forcing me to fail, and, and being blasé about it. Um, so I got recalled. And now I've got an excellent probation officer. I mean, I've had some good ones over the years, I have to say, who I can communicate with in terms of they understand the difficulties in life. But it's a difficult road to go forward if you're a life licence. So how do you do that? What are you doing in your life today that's keeping you, I say keeping you out of being recalled again, but what is it that's distracting you from the fight to have your conviction overturned? You, you, you know, the ordeal of spending 20 years in prison, you know, that's no mean feat to be able to overcome all the psychological difficult challenges, even five years, seven years down the line since you were first released. What, what are you doing in your life today that's keeping you focused? Funny enough, uh, the podcasts are, I like, but it seems so I've, I'm finding my own way in terms of, I've been talking to mental health groups just off messaging, okay, it started like that. And it shows that just by messaging, by me responding to one fellow, I've got 5,000 people on their, on their books, I'll say. From that's come, I seem to be steering more to doing lectures, university lectures. I've done Cambridge. I've done Prestigious Law Society around Marley Bone. I've done quite a few. And what are you talking about? Crime, criminal justice system, trying to put people off going back to prison. Mm. I did Constantine's that's coming out soon. Mm. That's Channel 4 or 5, I'll get you on now. And that was just saying, this is prison, do you want to go there? I mean, I've got one kid around the throat because he was a bit like giving it, you know, like that, walking down and bad boy attitude. So I pretended as if I was in a cell. But it was reaction. You know? So he was giving it a bit of attitude. I went, wallop. And uh, I said, right, you see that? I said, that's a knife at your throat. I said, and the two fellas behind me here, I says, they're going to stab you a bit. So I said, if you put up a fuss, we're going to take all your canteen, your PlayStation, and tomorrow you're going to phone your family, you're going to get them to send some money into an account. I said, otherwise oh, you're going to get done again. You got that? Yeah. Sat back. I went, that's what it's like in prison. Do you really want to go? Mm. The attitude just, mm. oh, no, I don't. 
So things like that, to, to see it in real life, don't come down here bleeding like you've got a pebble in your shoe and you've got shoulders as wide as that. Because mm. when you come to prison, you'll be as big as that. Mm. And you've got a knife in your throat. And you're a tough cookie here. You ain't a tough cookie in there. So I'm focused on trying to make these young kids like it ain't a holiday camp. You might have a TV. You might not have to go to work. You might be able to get your drugs in there. But you've got no life. You are existing. And it ain't quite as nice as you think. Because those so-called nice fellas that say, no, I was a right laugh in prison, they're the buggers that are robbing you half the time. Because they've got it easy or they're serving drugs or a certain way of life. And I just don't agree with that. You are also an author. Fitted up, fighting back, Kevin Lane. Yeah. That's quite an achievement, isn't it? 20 years in prison, you've written a book. What's this book about? First of all, I'd like to thank Nick Hopkins for naming it. Fit it up and fighting back. He came up with that. I called it Hitman or Hoover Salesman. Hopkins you, is a journalist, right? He's the editor in chief of the Guardian, a journalist, yeah. So I had it Hitman or Hoover Salesman. Big question mark. You decide. Read the evidence. He came forward and said, change it to that, Kevin. And we did. And I wrote the book. Uh, and it is doing exceptionally well. Not because there's a load of crime uh, followers who love crime books. But uh, respectively, from professionals to producers to film producers, documentary makers, law lords. I had a uh, demonstration outside of Parliament a year or so ago, and a law lord came out. He said, I love Kevin. He said, I've got his book. Uh, and that really chuffed me. And is it other... your life story? Is that what this is? Or is it about just, I say just, your case and what that entailed amalgamation of two right you have to give people a little bit of insight into your childhood growing up where you was a bit more than what i said earlier love life children violence prison what went on in prison a lot but the evidence is set out in a layman's term because terminology can be quite difficult and mm. so uh i judge my book not based on what they call it killing your baby, slashing your baby when you take words out. That's what some authors call it. I don't know if you've heard that before. Mm -mm. If you wrote a book and you took something, I'm not sure if you have, have you written a book? I have, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. But so, so when you take words out, it's like you're slashing your baby, they mm. call it, because it mm. pains you to take your words mm. out you've put there. Um, but people read my book and they come back with uh, an honest opinion and the reviews are excellent. So it's not what I say other people are say it's not because i love my book like i do it's because of what other people so i'm really proud of it well well done you what does second chance mean to you that's the theme of this podcast when i say what does second chance mean to you what does it mean bloody staying free and rebuilding your life and so look my grandchildren now and my sons i'm going out for me my oldest son now i'm really proud of my boys they're both fantastic earners quarter of a million pound a year one more than that at the moment, but uh, done well from whatever foundations I installed in them before I went to prison, it set them well and going forward in life. Um, so staying free, enjoying what life I've got left, because there ain't no dress rehearsal, is it? No, it's not. I'd like to do a bit more. Uh, I'm going to be retired, hopefully, in a few years. I'd like to be semi-retired. But you don't look never. old enough to be retired. I'm telling you how old I am. <laughs> Nor do you. Uh, <laughs> hey? So we're doing all right there. A bit tight today, but we understand that as well. I just, I'm enjoying what I'm doing. Um, that seems to be making people happy. And what I do makes people happy. But I would like to do something a lot better, a lot more. So I'm doing some more lectures at Derby University for the students, uh, studying law or whatever, or the criminal justice, whatever they're going into. I'm going to do my men's health, my charity work. I've got to do a nice podcast soon for Jump. Okay. Uh, rather than the gangster crime stuff, because look, it brings in awareness to my criminal conviction, which I need to get overturned. That's what all this is about. It's not about, do you know what? I want to sit here like, and tell you about the geese who I knocked out mm. and all I didn't knock mm. out mm. and the birds I've shagged and the birds I ain't shagged. Mm. I, I ain't like that. So I'm not interested. I do say, yeah, look, this happened. I hit him. He went to sleep. But it ain't in that manner. What I would like now to see, well, okay, there's a bit more about Kevin than what people think. He's not a dafty. He's quite intellectual. I'm a good businessman. I, I do very well in, in, I have done very well in my life. 
uh, and I may do all right with the, the recent project, but there's a bit more about him than I'm not a thug, but I can have a fight. There's a bit of a difference in there. Why do you have to be considered a criminal because you can have a fight or, or, or you, you know a few people? But it doesn't mean you come home and you predominantly want to be around that lifestyle. You, I've segregated myself and I mix with who I want to mix with who's not going to bring trouble to my door. And I don't want to come into your life where you might bring trouble to my door just through a police investigation that I've done nothing with that could get me recalled. Because you might be an active criminal importing a bit of puff. All right, I'm not, a good, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. A lot of people in this country like a bit of puff. They also might have a shit now, that skunk, but if they have a bit of old hemp, or there's the old, old school, old, old, the old criminals puff, wasn't it? Um, I say, yeah, crack on. If they're bringing in drugs into this country that ruin lives, I would not say, get, you know, I just don't like it and uh, don't agree with it because I don't want my kids sniffing that bleeding cocaine and whatever else they want to do. All right, uh, drugs that actually ruin society, some of them, because they just can't handle the addiction. So I'm hoping that um, my lifestyle can go forward and do a lot of benefit now. And that message is what? What's your message? 20 years in prison, labelled, as we said at the beginning of this interview, um, a number of things by the media, even now. What's your message? You described it eloquently when you talk about the kid that you kind of said, look, you want to be tough when you're in prison, you're no bigger than this. Brilliant. What's your message? Be happy with what you've got in life and appreciate the people around you. Gangsters, uh, all these films that say Angels with Dirty Faces, uh, James Cagney when he was cried at the, when he'd been hanged or electrocuted, wasn't it? Mm. He's been electrocuted. And the vicar got to ask him to cry. Because criminals are produced as heroes and they're not heroes. Whether it's heist, oh yeah, it's great, but it is a bleeding film. There are obviously things that take place in this world, but... Kids are being portrayed to think gangsters are the, the bee's knees, and there's not. It's a very sad life. So be happy with what you got, because if you spent 20 years in prison, you'd soon be happy to come home and go and get a job and be free. And then you'd have a much better life and a longer life, I think, if you're living uh, a cleaner life. So pick your right path. Thanks very much, Kevin. Raphael, thank you very much. Nice I to meet you. Enjoyed it. Good luck. <laughs>